Representative Shalala, you are truly inspirational, and um, we can't be even begin to thank you for your wise words and your leadership uh, of, uh, for health and health care here in the United States and, and globally. <clears throat> We're now going to um, uh, transition to our next panel. Um, I, why don't I invite the panelists to come up forward? They're going to speak one at a time, and then we're going to just do the. Then we'll just join them all. Um, so uh, we're going to begin with um, uh, Tony Fauci. Um, Tony has a hard stop at ten thirty, so with the panelists' uh, permission, I might just ask him a few questions after his talk, so that he can make sure that he can get away, because he won't be here for um, our roundtable discussion. Um, Tony is a dear friend. Um, we, we've known each other and worked each other with each other since the early days of AIDS and, and way beyond. Um, I think of him um, not just as the uh, longest serving director of the National Institutes of Algae and Infectious Diseases, um, but really as a national treasure. Um, he served how many presidents, Tony? Was it six presidents? He doesn't look that old, um, but uh, uh, but he was a baby when he when he when he first started. Um, so Tony is going to begin, uh, and I'll talk about ending the HIV/AIDS pandemic following the science, uh, both in the United States and globally. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much, Larry. It's really a, a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. I'm going to kick this off by introducing a, a subject that has. <clears throat> been actually very intensively discussed uh, over the last couple of years, but particularly over the last year, and you'll find out in a moment what I'm referring to, is that is the feasibility uh, of whether or not we will be able to do epidemic control to the point of ending the HIV epidemic as we know it, and that will lead to a whole series of questions that relate directly and indirectly to law and the things that this particular group is dealing with, even though I won't specifically address any of the legal issues, but make this sort of as a background. Several years ago, about four years ago, I wrote a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was entitled, Ending the Epidemic, Follow the Science. And that was really the, the prologue to a, a movement which has a, really evolved now over the last few years about looking at what we've accomplished and whether or not, from a scientific standpoint, we have the foundation or not to end one of the most important pandemics in our history. So let's take a look at what has happened since the very beginning of our realization that we were dealing with something new in 1981. The advances in science have been nothing short of breathtaking. I could use my entire seven or 10 minutes to go through each of these boxes over and over and over again, but the one that has really dominated has been in the area of treatment. Now, as Larry mentioned, he's known me for a very long time. Uh, this is a picture of me, believe it or not, in the winter of fall of 1981-82, just after the first cases were recognized of what was not even called AIDS yet. It was called GRIDS, and certainly we did not have a uh, an etiologic agent. The reason I show it, besides letting you know there was a time when I did have actually black hair with not a single white hair there, is that the, um, dura, the life expectancy of our patients was about a year. But then what happened over the next several years was in 1987, we had AZT. As you can see for the left side of the slide, we're able to decrease the level of virus modestly, but not durably. Patients felt better, did better, but almost every single one of them turned around and essentially relapsed. In 1994, when we had two drugs, we had a better decrease in virus and more durable. Some patients did very well, but no one really had a complete turnaround. And it was only in 1996, with the advent of the triple combination, did we have something we've never seen before, namely a diminution of virus to below detectable level that was durable. And as the years went by, we now have more than 30 drugs, which when given in combination, can completely turn around what we have known of as the usual clinical course of an HIV-infected individual. So getting back to the slide I showed you before, 
In the 1980s, the life expectancy was about 12 months, but that was because we didn't see the patients until they already had advanced disease. Then what happened is that when we were able to diagnose HIV after we knew it was HIV, we realized that there was about a median of 10 years before the patients who were untreated ultimately went on and died. But now today, astoundingly, if you have someone in the same room that I just showed you a few slides ago, who comes in 20, 22, 25 years of age, newly infected, you start them on triple combination now in one pill, you can look them in the eye and honestly tell them it is likely they would live an additional 50 plus years. So with that scientific advance, the question is, what are we going to do with that? Let me just quickly switch to prevention. We have multiple modalities of prevention. With HIV, it is not unidimensional. It's going to be a combination of treatments. Treatment as prevention is the one turning point which will allow us, together with PrEP, which I'll mention in a moment, to end the epidemic. We showed in a study several years ago something that we would not necessarily have predicted, is that if you look at an individual who's infected in a serodiscordant relationship with someone who's not infected, and you treat them early rather than waiting until they advance their disease, you decrease by 96% the likelihood that they will transmit the virus to their uninfected partner. Years later, we did a follow-up and found out something that we thought was unbelievable, so we went on to then prove it, that if you decrease the level of virus to below detectable level, you do not transmit, period. You do not transmit the virus. No one believed that. So we did a couple of studies. We did cohort studies which showed that with tens and tens and tens of thousands of condomless sex acts in a serodiscordant relationship, there was not one single linked transmission, which means that if you are undetectable, you are truly untransmissible. Now, if you take that and add it to people who are at risk but not infected, pre-exposure prophylaxis, one pill a day, now, in an individual at high risk, you can have a greater than 95% diminution in the likelihood that they would acquire infection. So what do we have now? What's the scientific basis? We have treatment as prevention, and we have pre-exposure prophylaxis. That's the fundamental scientific basis for a plan that I'll outline for you in just a minute or two of why we think we can end the epidemic in the United States as an epidemiological phenomenon. Because we know when we do treatment as prevention, we save lives, we prevent suffering, we prevent new infections. However, what you do if you implement that is that you can end the epidemic. So theoretically, so if you just take it for a second, what I've just told you, if you put everybody who's infected on antiretroviral therapy and drop the level below detectable, if you then get those at risk and put them on PrEP, Theoretically, you could end the epidemic tomorrow, but we don't live in a theoretical world. We live in a real world. So what we need to do is to bridge the gap between what we know is theoretically true and what we can realistically accomplish. And that leads to the plan that I mentioned, as you know, was announced by President Trump in the February 5th State of the Union address that we have a plan to end the epidemic over the next in the next decade. The day after that, this is very interesting for those of you who write papers for journals, I had written this paper for JAMA and Howard Buckner, the editor, they wouldn't let me submit it to the White House because they said, we don't know if the president is actually going to announce this. So don't submit the paper, but hang on to it. So I made a deal with the editor. I wrote the paper, I held on to it, and the Right an hour after the president got up and said, we're going to end the epidemic, I put send to JAMA. That was at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. At 8.30 in the morning, it was accepted by JAMA. Really? <laughs> but it was. And that's why it came out the next day. And in that, we outlined why we think this could be a true phenomenon. Because in the United States, most people don't realize it, we have a very unusual situation. We have what's called hotspots. We have demographic hotspots. 
Part of it is somewhat embarrassing about what goes on in this country, but it's true. 13% of our population is African American. 40 plus to 50% of the new infections are among African Americans. 60% are among men who have sex with men, and 75% are those under age 35. So we now have geographic, I will definitely be on time. You don't have to show me three minutes. I'll guarantee you I will stop in three minutes. <laughs> don't show me that. <laughs> OK. And then we have geographic hotspots. Another thing that's very interesting, we have 3,007 counties in the United States. In that, 50% of the new infections are in 48 counties, plus the District of Columbia and San Juan, Puerto Rico. That is amazing. 48 out of 3,000 of them, 50% of the infections. This is the map. The shaded blue are five southern states, excuse me, uh, seven southern states in which there is a high degree of rural problems. So what, when I say rural problems, I mean we have a high degree of HIV out of the cities. Not in Jacksonville, Mississippi, but in the rural areas. So this slide is a, a, a picture of, a, of an editorial I wrote in the Washington Post a couple of years ago. It's been three years now. And I show it to you right now because I said something then that I feel strongly about it now. With what I've just told you, with the scientific advances and the fact that we have hotspots, there are no more excuses. We have the tools to end the epidemic. And if we don't do that, I feel very certain that history is going to judge us very harshly for relinquishing a responsibility and an opportunity that has been given to us in an unprecedented way. Am I done? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tony. Um, that really was inspirational. And you know, you're right, no more excuses. Um, we can do it, we have the tools. Um, you've shown that we've got the hot zones, we've got the treatments, we've got the money, we should have the money, and we should do it. So here's my question. I think we can do it in the United States, globally. How do we scale up? How do we, if, if you, I'm thinking about um, two potentially really great American initiatives. One, of course, was PEPFAR um, uh, under uh, George Bush. And now we have this initiative to end AIDS in America today. How can we scale up PEPFAR with the Global Fund, UN AIDS, along with what we're doing, is, is it intractable globally, or can it be done? You know, th that's a great question. And, and the reason I, I chose the United, when I show about the United States, you would have to look at the United States as one country, and Africa, <laughs> as we all know, is a continent. And there are different countries in Africa that would have different capabilities. So in an area where you can have a focused not a diffuse epidemic, but a focused epidemic, you can do what you've done in the United States. Take South Africa. South Africa has the most infections of any country in the world. But if you look at certain sections of South Africa in KwaZulu-Natal, and you go to the clinics, you have a situation where women between the ages of 18 and 25, 50% uh, of them are infected, Larry. So that's something that is, is not what we have here in the United States. So what has to be done is you've got to figure out what are the flashpoints in that cycle of infection. Women are getting infected by older men. They then, in their infection, infect the younger men who then become older men and cycle around. So that's something that we really need to go after both the women and the men. That is a little bit different here. So the answer to your question, Larry, is we can't apply this model globally to Africa. There are going to be countries in Africa that we can actually do this. There are some countries in Africa that are going to require a different kind of implementation plan. And that's the reason why we have implementation science to determine what works in this country versus that country. One last question before you go, Tony. Um, we saw that young man in the, in the photograph. You still look that way. Um, and 
I, I remember back in the early days uh, of the AIDS uh, epidemic, and in my global health law book, I actually quote you um, by saying that, you know, you, you couldn't turn away AIDS advocates from NIH or CDC meetings. You just couldn't. Right. The, so civil society, bottom-up social mobilization has really changed. It, it defined the AIDS epidemic. Right. Could you reflect a bit yeah, on no, that? No, just very quickly. I mean, it's a long story, and I'll give it to you in a minute so she doesn't put another sign up for me. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm only kidding you. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you go back, the, the activism in the United States, I think, was an indispensable critical part in our response. I, I, I think we would have ultimately gotten to where we are right now, but it would have taken much longer, and there would have been many, many more infections and many, many more deaths. So to have civil society come up and break a paradigm, because the paradigm, Larry, was a very interesting paradigm. The AIDS activists broke that, but every other disease has, has benefited from that since then, and that is the misperception that someone in the community who's not a scientist not only doesn't understand, but has no voice in anything that has to do scientifically or clinically. We actually thought that as a scientific community. And it took a lot of uh, what I would say very um, uh, draconian measures on the part of the activists to shake the cages and get people to realize that. Now, it's kind of normal, it's accepted. If you look at all of the, the working groups we have, all the panels we have, all the councils we have, there's always representation from the community. There was zero representation from the community, which was, when you think about that, it was disgraceful, but it was the norm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Tony. Um, round of applause for Tony Fauci. Um, uh, we, we, we can see what you've done for our country and our world, Tony. Um, our next speaker is uh, Bruce Gellin. Um, Bruce is also a close friend of ours and of Georgetown's and, and of, of, of vaccination throughout the United States and globally, which is currently, the WHO says, is vaccine hesitancy is one of the top 10 global health problems in the world. Um, he's the president of uh, global immunization uh, at the Sabin Institute. Um, we're very proud and very happy to have you join us. Thank you. Well, thanks, Larry. Thanks, thanks for that, and thanks for uh, including this topic. You know, it's always a challenge to, fo to follow Tony Fauci, but I always learn something from Tony. And I think, but not everything, not every time do you learn something that's actionable. So if you have a paper that you need to get published, send it to Tony and have him push send. <laughs> so, uh, so when Larry asked me about uh, about talking about this today as part of this uh, as part of this uh, seminar. My first question was, you know, vaccines and the law. I sort of knew part of that. Um, he said everything, and I guess my, my takeaway is most things. So my, 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 my goal here today is to give you a, sort of a tasting menu about the intersection of vaccines, vaccination, uh, and law, and how that has implications for justice. I mostly have a, have a, global, uh, a global look, but there's a global also includes the United States. So um, in a way, this is when you know, all you have is a hammer, the whole world is a nail, so you're gonna hear this from a vaccine person. So what, I, what I'm gonna give you in this tasting menu is a, sort of a, a few snapshots of some of the places where vaccine and vaccination intersects with the law, and they come in different ways, from resolutions, legislation, regulations, authorities, and frameworks. Those are, those are the kind of words I guess you hear all the time in law schools, but not so much in medical schools. But I think that these are the things that, that you'll see soon as sort of the number of examples where uh, the, the, the vaccine global health intersection with law leads to justice and equity. Because this is not a vaccine audience, I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of where we are because people often don't know that, but there's been incredible progress. Uh, just a few things to feature that in the past decade, and I'll get to that in a second, there have been 116 million infants who received uh, recommended uh, sort of some of the basic vaccines. An additional four, four and a half million children have been vaccinated in 2017 compared with 2010, which is when this decade of vaccine began. 
and, and importantly, uh, almost 2 million fewer children who are under-vaccinated uh, have been vaccinated again in that, in that same that period of time. The decade of vaccine, Bill Gates at Davos in 2010 declared this, that, the, the, that would, this would be the decade of vaccines. He put significant investments into that decade, and many things happened. Among them was the, the establishment of something called the Global Vaccine Action Plan, and here comes the resolution part. So at the World Health Assembly, and people mentioned that, uh, that the, this is a, an, an annual event in May, and there are things coming that are, that are relevant this year as well. But in, in, in May of 20, 2012 came this resolution for the Global Vaccine Action Plan and recognizing vaccines as a core, core component of the human right to health. And importantly, that to ensure that every eligible individual is immunized with all appropriate vaccines, irrespective of geographical location, age, gender, disability, educational level, socioeconomic level, ethnic group, or work condition. I think that defines what you're trying to do here. So there, there it is, that this is a, a vaccines for all. Just a few other vignettes into this. This gets into the legislation part. When the GAVI, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, is, is responsible for uh, providing vaccines for the poorest in the world. Part of their model is as, as the economies improve, that the countries have to go it on their own, and therefore to, to go from being a, uh, a donor dependent to having their own, uh, their own financing of vaccines. Sabin has worked with a number of the countries and, uh, with, with, for Gavi on this and helping the countries bring that forward, what was called a sustainable immunization financing program. And again, the important part of that was the, was the, the evolution and the establishment of legislation with the key, the key point being that the goal of sustainable financing is not achieved until the parliament passes laws defining how immunization programs are financed in perpetuity. Without that, they're not gonna go anywhere. So in a couple of places, with, and there are many countries at this, at this transition into, into improved economies, in Nepal and in Laos, where we worked, that we were able to, with, with field workers there, work, working with the local parliamentarians, establish these laws. And again, as you see at the, at the base, of, this is written by our field officer, that at, that at the heart of this for Nepal was that it was an important way to, to do many things, but financing wasn't a piece of it. And in Laos, just last year, they passed a law as well. Again, there are many parts of the immunization law about some technical aspects, but importantly is about the ensuring sustainable financing and making sure that there was average co it was coverage to all, particularly those the, at, the, at the margins. Switching to regulations, the international health regulations were revised in, in 2005. These, as, 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 uh, as, as Larry mentioned earlier, these were based on previous sanitary regulations that were in the, in the mid-1800s, mostly on trying to control cholera, typhoid, and yellow fever. Took, there was some updating, and now this is obviously rele relevant uh, to in, in the post-Ebola world, but it, this, is a, this is about strengthening health systems to, to control infectious disease and other global health threats. There are many components to this, but, but the one I want to focus on is the response. And, and then, and for, again, from my perspective, the, re the response is about the role that a, an immunization program can play as part of that response uh, if it's needed. The, the, the teeth in this, really, the establishment was called these joint uh, external evaluations, where countries, countries had outside uh, evaluators look at their programs. Uh, I think, th think two-thirds of the countries have had these kind of evaluations to date. I'm going to feature just the United States as a preview of this. But the, the point of this was that among the 19 things that are being measured as far as the strength of a health system is, is the immunization system with the target of a functioning national delivery system. The U.S. assessment, um, that among the challenges, there are still persistently low vaccination rates in small sub subpopulations and at-risk groups. Sound like the headlines? So we're seeing this now, and this was the, the evaluation was done a few years ago. It's not a surprise to anybody. Measles is the most infectious virus that we know, and if people are susceptible and are near a virus, they will get 90% chance they will get measles. So you see these, the, this is our, our, our indicator, if you will, of, of pockets of susceptibility. But I give you that because it gets into other, another piece of this, was the authorities of local health, of local health departments um, uh, making uh, vaccine requirements to try to pr protect the population at large. Early in April, New York City declared measles an emergency. There was a lot of back and forth, and it's worked its way into the courts. And just uh, yesterday, there's the, the, the uh, attempt to overturn that by people who didn't like that didn't go anywhere. This is, we're gonna continue to see this in many other places. That'll probably be part of our discussion, and we'll, 
We'll take it from there. But this is not new. In 1947, a traveler from Mexico on a bus to New York City ended up dying in New York, and it didn't, they didn't know he had smallpox until after he died. So you can imagine the public health response to that of trying to figure out where this guy had been and who he was next to. Um, so what, what I find striking about this picture is how orderly this line is in New York City. I don't think you can get this today, um, but there you have it. But again, the, the key here is that the, the health commissioner was out there um, trying to make sure that people he was protecting his community uh, and, 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 and not requiring, but uh, suggesting so strongly that people get vaccinated. Some of the same issues today of people who didn't, uh, who didn't want to be vaccinated. I want to flash forward to another piece, which will lead to a framework. In the, in the bird flu era, so this is 2005-ish, um, when the world was concerned that this uh, new virus that was highly lethal was gonna, was gonna crack that genetic code and become transmissible and set off the next pandemic, there was a concern about, about making sure we had, that, the, that the scientific community had access to viruses to do a risk assessment, to try to better understand what about this virus was doing such bad things. Um, Indonesia, which was one of the, the, the target countries, uh, decided that this would, they, this, there, was, there was nothing in it for them. They were donating viruses to the system and were not getting anything out of it. Um, the, health, the health minister for Indonesia wrote a book about it, and really this was the theme. It's time for the world to change uh, in the spirit of dignity, equity, and transparency. And you can see her quotes here about, about the, they will develop a vaccine and we won't get it, was, this, was the heart of this. Um, the... Let me go back to this one. So the piece in the New York Times is 2007 talking about this. The book was in 2008. And this Times piece was saying this is a bump in the road, uh, and the officials thought that they would sort of get to this next week, uh, and soon after they would sort this out, 2007. In 2011, a few years later, um, this, tr this uh, negotiations finally was complete. Uh, this is a special set of people who have the... the the stamina to have these 24-7, four-year-long negotiations to develop this framework, which is about uh, uh, equating the access to the virus for risk assessment to the access to the benefits. And, and again, the key was here, again, for the point of equity, was to increase the access of developing countries to vaccines and other pandemic-related supplies and, and ensure that there was sharing that was going on. Influenza virus is the only um, virus of all the microbes that has a special treaty like this. Um, there's still a, there still is a, an open question about how well sharing will go on with this uh, sharing of uh, uh, sharing of virus and, sh and access to benefits. Another part for a discussion. And then finally, I just want to talk about another piece of work that Sabin did um, in in concert with Georgetown when we were asked by the by Gavi to take a look at at evolving legisl immunization legislation in Europe. And so we thought, well, maybe we should talk to lawyers about laws. So that we're glad that uh, we, we're, we were to, to, to able to couple with the, uh, the law school here on, this, on the O'Neill Institute on this project. Uh, there's a lot to this, but the, the, point, the point here is that what we're looking at here is primarily is uh, the, the laws related to recommendations or mandates or that spectrum. Um, we, 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 they, uh, categorize the, uh, all the countries in, in Europe by looking at these, at, at sort of at looking at these, at these eight questions, and then with that to categorize countries into this essentially a sliding scale from rec recommended without a lot of teeth to mandates with a lot of enforcement. Uh, I won't get into that. I would encourage you to take a look at the report. Um, but the bottom line is that they we're able to do this, and you can see here this spectrum, and it's color-coded uh, to see where things, uh, how things fell out. And what we found is that this is particularly interesting to, to other countries who are trying to think about the same thing, to share the experiences of others. So I leave you with that, and I thank Georgetown for that. And I, I end with where I began when Larry asked me about what's vaccines got to do with the law, pretty much everything. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah, and if you think about uh, uh, religious and, and uh, philosophical exemptions in the United States, you know, removing them as California, uh, West Virginia, and Mississippi have done could, could make a big difference. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, one of our own, one of our best and brightest, Matt Kavanaugh, 
Um, Matt um, is project director here at the Institute. He's um, been a champion for human rights, civil society, works on AIDS, uh, tuberculosis, um, currently has a major project uh, looking at how the next White House um, would be able to ramp up global health policies to help lead the world. So um, thank you, Matt, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you on the topic constitutionalizing health. Thanks, Larry. Um, so I am um, here at the law school to talk about constitutions, which you would not think was a, um, a surprising thing to do. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is constitutions and a socioeconomic right to health, which here in Washington, D.C. Is, is actually a rather odd thing to, to be doing. So the core question that I'm going to talk through a little bit is this is from a project that we're working on right now, trying to understand the degree to which constitutions actually matter for public health outcomes. And so if we look, for example, at Botswana and South Africa, right next door to each other, you've got Botswana that's wealthier, has stronger economic growth, has less inequality, fewer ethnic divisions, et cetera, et cetera. All of the things that social scientists say should result in lower rates of mortality, and yet South Africa has 10% lower under five mortality. Now there's multiple reasons for that, but might one be that South Africa has a constitutional right to health while, South while Botswana does not? So this is countries with a positive right to health, and what we see is that worldwide countries are increasingly adopting a, an enforceable, judicially um, rep recognized right to health in their constitutions. It's become part of the lexicon of writing constitutions as time has gone by. Um, but is this actually a good thing? So again, sitting here in Washington, D.C., where our constitution famously does not have any socioeconomic rights at the national level, um, the answer from many is to be deeply skeptical, right? So you've got kind of skeptical thinkers who say judges are never going to engage um, in health in a meaningful way, right? That if we look at the Nordic countries, world leaders in health, they don't have constitutions with the right to health. And if we actually kind of remember all the way back to Alexander Hamilton, who reminded us, right, that the judicial branch doesn't have control of the purse or the sword, or in 2019, the bureaucracy um, that would actually affect health, we might be really skeptical. On the other hand, we might also worry that it would be negative, right? So do we really want judges making decisions about who does and do, does not get access to health care? Might inexpert judges be bad? at making polycentric decisions that are involved in healthcare that have to involve trade-offs writ large, might we get an individualist response? Constitution writers and ethicists seem to think the latter, but what do we know? So what did we do? We actually, in this project, tried to look at the answer to what's happening with constitutions and the right to health. So we looked at the, um, the political, the economic, and the social determinants of health to ask the question, what do we know about countries that have adopted a right to health, and what's happened over time, over the last 40 years? And what we see is that if you control for all sorts of things, and I'm very happy to talk about the statistics, but, but the upshot is to say countries with a right to health actually are healthier than countries without it, if you control for wealth, if you control for all of the major theories that should explain cross-national variation. So is that real, right? What's going on actually within countries? And so we looked a little bit deeper. We said, all right, do countries with the right to health, do they actually provide more of what matters for the poor? If especially poor people are driving, especially globally, um, mortality rates. Is there, what's going on? And what we see is that the worries of the skeptics, that basically what's going to happen if you make constitution, if you make health a constitutional right, you'll get those with access to the ju judicial system suing for really expensive things. You're going to make the health system very expensive, but you're not actually going to get any benefits, right? You're just going to kind of get middle class folks trying to access it. That worry doesn't seem to hold up in the data. So the countries that we looked at don't spend more on health overall. They do spend a larger portion of what they do spend publicly. But overall, what you see is that you see lower out-of-pocket expenses, and you see across the board um, better skilled birth attendants, better immunization rates, apropos of the talk that just was had, and more availability of medicines writ large. 
So, okay, that's all fine and good, but we've tried to look then to say, all right, can we actually look a little deeper? Can we understand a bit more about what's going on within a set of countries? So we are in the middle of a multi-year study that's actually looking at the right to health and constitutionalization in South Africa, India, Malawi, and Thailand, doing in-depth uh, interviews, process tracing, et cetera, to track a whole bunch of different policy issues. Here are the policy issues that we're looking at in South Africa and India. I won't go into all of them because I don't have the next 45 minutes. But instead, just to say that actually across the board, a lot of policy issues are getting, uh, are seeing right to health mobilization. So what's happening, I'm gonna talk about two quick stories. The first is South Africa. So this is probably the most famous and most well-known story of the constitutionalization of health. Where in um, South Africa, the president at the time, Thabo Mbeki, and Monto, his, um, his minister of health, were opposing the rollout of antiretrovirals on the theory that HIV might not cause AIDS. And so as we think about what that looked like, what we should see kind of writ large if we think about all of the theories of what should, should happen is that we should see democratic pressures coming to bear, right? And eventually, science is eventually gonna win out, right? And so in South Africa, what do you see? You see the mobilization of doctors, you see the mobilization of civil society, you see elections, you see front page headlines, you see world condemnation, and still President Becky doesn't back down. It's not actually until the activists go to court and go all the way to the constitutional court that we actually see a change in the politics. And they win at the constitutional court. And what changes is not necessarily that court order because actually the legal case itself was very, very narrow. But instead what we see is a change in the politics. So all of a sudden, it's the ANC versus the constitutional court. And so you've got lawyers and judges involved and you've got a different way of framing the issue. You've got a different set of questions that are being asked. And what you end up with is the cabinet overruling the president. To, his, the, to the end, President Becky has said that in fact he does not believe that he was wrong. So if we had waited for elections, if we had waited for him to change his mind, we might never have gotten there, but eventually we did. So I want to tell two more, two, one more story, which is just the very opposite of this, which is this is a picture of a place called Kohamouth in Eastern Cape. It is as far from Constitution Hill and the Constitutional Court of South Africa as you could possibly imagine, in rural Eastern Cape. And the problem there was the lack of ambulances. So ambulances, you wouldn't think, would be a major determinant of health, but actually in rural, um, in rural Eastern Cape, they are. They've been linked to a major cause because people can't get access to basic care, and so people die in childbirth. A major cause of maternal and child death is just being able to get there, and also people can't get access to, can't get access to, to um, health without paying massive uh, fees to be able to get transported by private transport. And so it's bankrupting families. And so for a decade, folks tried to address this because all of the ambulances were in the wealthier and whiter neighborhoods, right? And for over a decade, this happened. There were front page stories revealing how bad this was for rural, uh, rural people. There were even a march to the capital. There was a parliamentary inquiry into what was going on. And it wasn't until the Human Rights Ca Commission had a complaint from a tiny little NGO called the Bulungule Incubator. And what the Human Rights Commission in South Africa was able to do is they were able to bring, bring forward a set of hearings where they actually made government come and sit and answer a set of questions that they never had before. And what they revealed was that the government continued to plan to fail. They were going to get ambulances, they kept saying to, to Ahamouth, in 2029 20, was the unwritten, unsaid thing. So instead, by doing that, they ended up changing the dynamics radically, and the politics of who had power and who didn't in that case um, really shifted. And what you saw very quickly was within a few months of the Human Rights Commission uh, coming together, the budget shifted. Funding went into ambulances. All of a sudden, for the first time, what you saw was the first meeting between the community and the head of the EMS service, who had refused to even come out and see it. And that is the ambulance in Kohamau. So what's going on here? And I'm gonna just wrap up in a moment. But the, the core of what's going on here is not so much, and I will reveal that I'm not a lawyer, but instead a political scientist slash activist, and that what, what I, what's going on here is that courts matter, but it's not court orders that matter. It's courts as institutions. It's the idea of the right to health as a constitutional institution that actually allows new venues. If you get a no in one venue, can you go to another venue to actually shift things? Or is it that bureaucracy gets to capture and is that what's happening? What constitutes appropriate action is shifting in these policies, right? So that good, the good of public health gets to be balanced against all sorts of things. And which actors have power shifts when there's a constitutional right to health. So in closing, let me just ask, what does this mean for the United States? 
So we just heard from Representative Shalala um, talking about the Medicare for All hearing that happened the other day. There will certainly be another go at um, attempting to do, sh uh, do a new set of policies around health. And so should we think about the lessons here? Now, should we change the US Constitution to have a right to health? I think the answer is yes. Do I think that's likely anytime soon? No. But what are the lessons here? The core lessons are you could actually institute a set of things that would do these same mechanisms. If you were to, say, have processes, give people a right to health through kind of various institutions, frame things in rights language, and actually create institutions to enforce it, you could actually see a change in public health. So thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. Um, uh, constitutions and the right to health do matter. And thank you for letting us uh, see that so clearly. Um, our next speaker is uh, Victor Zhao. Um, Victor is the president of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, he led the Duke University uh, uh, medical system as chancellor and professor there. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing him as a member of the National Academy of Medicine. And I think the, the best example I can give of his leadership is when West African Ebola epidemic was raging out of control. He single-handedly um, partnered with uh, Jim Kim at the World Bank, Margaret Chan at the World Health Organization, and formed a truly transformative uh, global commission on global health security. And many of the reforms of WHO today were because of you, Victor. And I was proud to serve on your commission, so thank you. So Larry, uh, you give us way too much credit, but we're glad to take it. Um, so I don't read instructions well, so I didn't make any slides. I thought it was a five minute, but I'll just, uh, but I do have some notes that I want to talk to you about. So uh, the title of my uh, uh, conversation is Global Health Security in the Age of Ebola and Novel Diseases. Well, I think Ebola is a starting point because we've certainly had outbreaks previously but I think the West Africa Ebola was the wake-up call, where, in fact, as Larry said, lots of people mobilized, lots of organizations mobilized, and actually end up in, a, I think now, a better place than we were before. So if you permit me, what I'll do is to give you a little history about the West Africa virus, uh, uh, Ebola, talk about where we are in the recent uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and then maybe speculate some of the issues you talk about in terms of governance, law, and others. So uh, 2014 was the outbreak, and all told in West Africa, over 11,000 deaths. Now, you know, in response to, and, and many of you, were, I'm sure, were following this, and for those who work in the field, you say there's a lot of concern, lots of criticism of all the things that were not done. So there were, as Larry said, four reports which are critical, one of which is from us, the International Commission, another one, of course, one is WHO, one for UN, and one at Harvard uh, London Tropical Medicine Consortium. I think all of them have more or less the same recommendation, which is we're not prepared, the response is terrible, so guess what? The things you need to do are strengthening national health systems, public health, and the ability to respond and care for those who are infected. Much better global and regional coordinating capabilities, much more rapid reporting, and of course, much better response, faster and better coordinated because the response was very fragmented with civil society responding to it first and then WHO coming later. All this led to a series of specific recommendations. One is that WHO should lead a global uh, infectious outbreak pandemic response. Second, there should be an emergency committee that advises WHO so they can call for emergency or not. Third is, there's need to be money available because one of the biggest problems was a lack of funding and therefore a lack of ability to pay people to mobilize a surge response. And fourth is countermeasures, access to therapies and vaccines. 
And finally, the need to have an independent mechanism to monitor and look at preparedness and weather country preparedness because it's felt that WHO cannot watch itself. So we need some other mechanism. So lots of things happened since then. First, the creation of the International Oversight Advisory Committee for WHO. Second is the ability to actually have donor countries bring in 70 million, 100 million dollars of emergency funds so that they can mobilize immediately when there's an outbreak. Third is the World Bank pulled together a um, insurance plan, which is called Pandemic uh, uh, Emergency Facility uh, Financing, uh, which is about $500 million with insurance companies and donor countries. And fourth is the creation of a coalition for epidemic preparedness and innovation, CEPI, in which I serve on the board. And finally is a independent monitoring board co-convened by WHO and the World Bank called the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board on which I serve on the board. So those were really good movements, if you will, to move to make the countries more prepared. As Bruce said, there's also issues of looking at how to monitor preparedness. There was, in fact, the international health regulation he mentioned. It turns out that piece of looking preparedness is self uh, reporting, and the data looks horrible. So, as he pointed out, there's been movement in the creation of different activities, including now what's known as a joint external evaluation, which is very um, specific measurements coming to countries to look at how well they do. And that, in fact, is now 90 such countries have undergone this voluntary external evaluation. And I would say it won't surprise you that data looks at we're not very well prepared globally. And of course, it depends on how wealthy the country is, how well they do. Now, what happened at DRC is a good test whether all those things mattered. So as you know, the uh, outbreak first occurred in uh, May or July in Ecuador in 2018, but it was declared as a real outbreak in, Ju in August 2018. It is the second largest Ebola outbreak in history, about 1,400 confirmed cases and 900 deaths altogether. Now, the more recent outbreak on the east side, North Kifu and Ituro, Ituri conferences, uh, provinces are a great concern because while initially it was thought that the uh, outbreak was contained, now it moves into these conflict zones long time civil war, mistrust of the foreign you know, help, et cetera, created a very difficult situation to try to, uh, to uh, um, control. So let's take a little report card. How do we do in response? Well, I think most of us give high marks for WHO this time, well prepared, being one of the first to be there, working with the DRC government, along with International Red Cross, UNICEF, and of course, civil, civil society. So that certainly has kept the outbreak in a controllable fashion. Secondly, money were mobilized. Some around $37 million of contingency fund was mobilized. That would not have been available, and certainly not available then in the first in the West Africa outbreak. The pandemic preparedness uh, emergency uh, uh, facility, the, um, the, the insurance, only $20 million were used because a set of goals to say you have to have a certain number of deaths, you have a certain number of trajectory, and you have to cross a country border. So there's a lot of concern and complaint that in fact has not been as effective as it is. And I know the World Bank and others are thinking about resetting those goals. And um, I think Larry wrote effectively that they should call for a public health emergency of international concern that's not happened as yet, I'm sure Larry will ask this question later on. Um, so uh, vaccine, very important. This time now, during the West Africa, there were vaccines developed. And of course, there was an early study on rigged vaccination, but they was just not able to mobilize. This time, the VSV Merck vaccine uh, vaccinated over 100,000 people with about 90 
percent participation and using a ring protocol, which means you take, first of all, the most highly um, vulnerable, the contacts and the health workers. And then you look at looking at that ring out by vaccinating. And the control study, which was done previously, is to look at people with out 14 days or versus within the first few days. And it showed clearly effectiveness. So that's really good news. And the vaccine is 98% effective. Only concern is stockpiling. There's concern there's not sufficient amount of vaccines now. And of course, there are other experimental vaccines not at the same stage that's being considered. Um, I think that uh, Tony is not here, but Tony mobilized a monoclonal antibody from NIH and there are other countermeasures and drugs which are now being tested. And I would say, I would end this, and then I'd like to speculate a little bit about this regulation, et cetera, by saying that, yes, we've done better, but we still have a long way to go because it's speculated this outbreak may go for another six months to a year because it's happening in the conflict zone. In fact, uh, workers are being assaulted, facilities are being burned, and it's not secure for people to work there. So there is, in fact, a lot of issues that has to be discussed. I think when I look back on this issue of law, this is how I look at it. First of all, uh, these outbreaks are happening in one country, but it's so rapidly cross borders. And if you mobilize international response, the question of sovereignty becomes a real issue. So you have to deal with that to begin with. And of course, you also need global governance structure to see how you can coordinate response. So the issue between global and then as you load into country, that becomes pretty complicated. Second is if you look at the ability to move forward with vaccines and treatments, which obviously all these are somewhat experimental, when we'll have to go through a lot of approval process of local RLB, and in fact, actually the FDA equipment regulation to be approval, that's another set which is a great, great uh, um, challenge. And of course, there are efforts to try to harmonize protocols and even very early bring together regulatory agencies to talk about how to actually move, make sure that something's approved in one area can be easily uh, quickly approved the other. Obviously, security. This is a big issue. Military, security, law security, law enforcement is an issue. And then finally, public-private partnership. It's well recognized that uh, the private sector can play a very big role. But as you know, rules and laws that regulate supply chain and other types of activities are highly different in different countries. And that also greatly inhibits the ability to the public sector, private sector work along public sector. So those are my main comments, and I see I got a zero. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Victor. Um, global health security preparedness is still a big problem as the DRC Ebola uh, epidemic uh, demonstrates. Um, our next speaker is Ambassador uh, Bonnie Jenkins. Um, Bonnie um, was the former coordinator for threat reduction in the US uh, Department of State. Uh, she's currently founder and president of the Women of Color Advancing Peace Security and Conflict Transformation. Um, Bonnie's had an um, incredible um, career uh, in uh, health and other kinds of smart diplomacy. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward and most grateful to you, Bonnie, for coming. Good morning. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's always great to come uh, to Georgetown Law um, and to the O'Neill Institute um, to do presentations. I have the honor of, of uh, coming here for both health issues and some of the other issues I work on, um, are on a hard security issue. So it's always wonderful to be in this room and, and to share thoughts with all of you and to hear about, about these issues also from other uh, folks and the great experts that are always here. 
Um, I also do not have a PowerPoint slide, um, which I'm sure is going to be helpful because I know we're running behind schedule. Um, I also just kind of wrote down some notes because I, I believe this is kind of a, a it's called a rapid kind of thing here. So I'm just going to write a few notes. Let me just get away from that so I'm not messing with that. Um, and uh, on this issue of smart diplomacy. And whenever I, I do a presentation, I like to see if we're all on the same, we start from the same point. So I always try to have a definition. And so I was looking for a good definition of smart diplomacy and everything that came up was smart power. So I figure I could use that because the definition of smart power does include both hard and soft power. And very often diplomacy is viewed as soft power. So looking at the definition from back in 19, from 2009, from Joe Nye, as some of you may have heard, he says power is one's ability to affect the behavior of others to get what one wants. There are three basic ways to do this, coercion, payment, and attraction. Hard power is the use of coercion and payment. Soft power is the ability to obtain preferred outcomes through attraction. Um, and if a state can get the agenda for others to shape their preferences or shape their preferences, it can save a lot of carrots, save a lot on carrots and sticks. Um, so I think that that, that definition is adequate uh, to start out with in terms of uh, diplomacy and soft power, which of course I always prefer to use soft power rather than hard power if at all possible, though of course hard power is sometimes needed. Uh, but my definition for um, smart diplomacy, in this case, uh, where we're talking about health issues, is really finding ways to use diplomacy to help promote um, an equitable and fair public health and health access around the world. Um, for me, diplomacy is being used smartly when it, one, is working lockstep with the policies and goals that we seek, two, that as diplomats, we or should work with lawyers to understand what is possible and what is legal. And three, ensuring that we have a clear strategy in what we're trying to achieve and a strategy that in fact promote global health, um, both, glo both, uh, both globally of course, as well as nationally. Now the points that were made this morning provide excellent views about the role of law and what can, be, what can be done to use law to promote equity in global health. And I've had the unique experience, as some of you have also had, of being both a lawyer and a diplomat in this work. My connection to the work of global health really came through my engagement uh, in the global health security agenda, uh, which, as most of you probably already know, is an effort to strengthen our capacity around the world of countries to be able to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease. And this agenda, of course, was, uh, was launched before Ebola, actually in February of 2014, and, and, we, and the Ebola outbreak really started the month after. So there obviously was a lot of thinking in the, at least in the US government before, the, before we launched this and engaged other countries about the issue of infectious disease. And my engagement started because of my background, which is hard security, but I also work on biosecurity issues. And for those of you who are aware of the GHSA, it includes um, a number of issues that are not just health um, in terms of accidental or natural, but in terms of man-made or, or human-made, which is uh, where I came into the, the agenda. Um, however, looking back, um, I'm interested at how little we actually worked uh, on a regular basis, continuous basis, with uh, lawyers on this. And I think one of the reasons is because we weren't necessarily proposing something that was going to be legally binding. GHSA is not a legally binding uh, effort or agreements made are not legally binding. Um, however, we one of the major goals of the GHSA is to promote countries compliance with the WHO interna international health regulations. Um, so while we did not have a lot of integration, I think all along the process with uh, lawyers, um, uh, I think it is interesting as I reflect on the process and what we did. Um, I've had a number of uh, discussions with colleagues who are lawyers um, 
And the remark that they often make is that the lawyers are often brought in at the end um, in the area of, of many things but, uh, in the area of global health. Um, and it was interesting for me because my background is not necessarily global health. And I was, uh, now that I've been working on it for like five years, I feel like I know a bit more. But it was interesting, and I thought about that uh, and, and the importance of lawyers being part of discussions from the start and from the beginning. We've talked about the joint external evaluations, and those are, are really great efforts, international efforts of teams of experts that go to countries, as you've heard, to assess uh, whether countries are ready uh, and capable and have the capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to diseases. Um, and when they first started the JEEs, um, before it was even turned over to the WHO, um, a colleague of mine used to accompany some of the teams uh, on the JEE, and she's a lawyer. And she was the only lawyer, and she often remarked uh, about how much it would have been helpful if there was more involvement of legal views uh, early on. Um, and she reminded of the importance of laws and regulations that will ensure that countries are able to uh, do what they need to do uh, to uh, implement some of the things that uh, we talk about for global health security. And she once again noted, you know, how often um, the legal viewpoint is brought in at the end. And a large part of the GHSA is helping not only for countries to do their own strengthening, but to provide assistance to other countries if they're able to do that. And assistance here is also needed in terms of making sure that countries have the capacity to uh, develop and implement laws and regulations related to global health. And so um, I think those are important points and I'm glad that she was part of that uh, JEE effort and hopefully that the legal perspective is also maintained in what's being done. But it was also important to see the role of diplomacy and the things that we were able to do in terms of promoting global health and capacity for uh, dealing with infectious disease. And the one thing that I will say is that we definitely had a diplomatic strategy, which I, which I think was extremely important. Uh, we had a strategy in terms of not, not just globally, but first nationally to make sure that we had all the important actors in the U.S. government who were part of this effort, and we promoted that when we, when we did this overseas, recognizing that to deal with issues of global health, you need to have not just the scientists and the, and the doctors, but you need to have uh, other entities in, in the government also involved, particularly if you're talking about prevent, detect, and respond. Uh, we realized the importance of engaging diplomatically all the relevant international organizations, uh, including those that deal with the One Health approach, World Organization of Animal Health and Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, we understood um, that all the goals had to be developed with countries and not by any one country. And we also understood uh, the importance of having uh, an ongoing process. We have a steering committee as well as we have annual ministerials. And we also understood, and Victor mentioned this, the importance of working with those outside government, whether you're talking about private sector or NGOs, academic institutions, um, think tanks, and, and others who are involved in this work. So in this sense, when I look at uh, the role of smart diplomacy in terms of having a strategy, uh, making sure that we are promoting the goals that we set out and making sure that we include all, the, in, all of the actors, including lawyers, um, I see diplomacy as a tool, really, that is that can be used in a promotion of what we seek, and diplomacy as a leader and also what we seek. But also that diplomacy and law are both uh, tools that can be used and need to be used in order to promote our overall goals uh, of the U.S. and working with other countries. Um, but I also see law as setting the parameters around which diplomats can engage and also promote those goals. So I think I'll just leave it at that. I'm exactly on time. Thank you. I think I'm, we're going to call all the panelists up. Okay, um, we've only got uh, 10 or 15 minutes for our panel since we're a little bit far behind. So as they're assembling, I'm going to uh, start the questions. Um,
both Bruce and Victor um, talked about vaccines. Um, uh, and of course, we know that um, we've got a, a major uh, uh, measles outbreaks here in the United States. Um, we know that WHO has said that um, vaccination is both one of the great achievements, but also one of the great global health crises that exist. Um, so I, and then um, Victor talked about um, uh, the experimental, the investigational vaccine uh, uh, on Ebola uh, at, in the uh, DRC, showing what the power of vaccines can be. Can you both reflect a little bit about um, why we're seeing this uptake in childhood diseases and also um, then, Victor, perhaps a little bit about vaccine supplies and research and development on vaccines. Sure. So, Bruce, would you begin? Sure. Well, I mean, it's not the the short the short answer is it's nothing new. Um, in in forums like this, when when they're focused on vaccine hesitancy, somebody will show a political cartoon from the early 1800s that shows Edward Jenner vaccinating a cow, and behind him, everyone looks like cows. So, from the early days and the, there was con there was concern about about immunization. You know, I think that's a difference between the prevention side and the treatment side. When people are sick, uh, they'll take all kinds of treatment to get better. When they're well, they wonder what the vaccines are doing to them. So I think that we haven't done a good job of communicating the those aspects of the vaccine, and particularly because vaccines are probably unique or unusual in that they benefit both the person and the individual. As I mentioned before, measles is the litmus because it's the most infectious virus, and when there are pockets of susceptibles, uh, the virus will find them. And you see that light, light showing up here. I think the flip side of that is that if we had a population that was much more un under vaccinated than it is now, these little uh, clusters of disease would be a raging fire. So I think that we do need to understand that, and I think we're, we're identifying some of these pockets. We can talk some more about the, the values of the, of the people who are, who are being under vaccinated. And I think that's on a global standpoint, we also, also need to, dist to distinguish those who don't have access from those who have access and, deter and, def and, def and defer. And they're, and they're very separate, like in Madagascar, which is having uh, major outbreaks um, uh, because of uh, under underutilization of vaccines. It's mostly because of access, and we forget that. So, I mean, first of all, there are vaccines that work already out there, like MISOs and others, and issues matter of having access to it. Then there's the vaccines needed looking at new outbreaks, new viruses, etc. And that remains to be a major problem because, as you know, most people would argue that vaccine is a market failure. In other words, when you have vaccine development, the amount of, uh, as you can imagine, for companies, the return is going to be marginal. So very few people want to develop vaccine, but there are some major companies which are committed to, like J&J, &J, Merck, and others. So I think a big issue, therefore, is how to actually get people really involved and develop vaccine. This is where I mentioned CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, was kicked into place after the West uh, Africa Ebola. And CEPI raised 750 million, maybe towards a billion dollars, through Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, three, four major countries like Germany, Japan, Norway, but also Australia, UK, et cetera, in order to create a fund as a public-private partnership that includes companies in there to look at how to enable the movement of early-stage vaccine all the way to phase human clinical trial, phase two, phase three. And that seemed to be working quite well because many vaccines are being developed in smaller companies and more like biotech startups. And getting those kind of access to fund enabled to develop further. Only issue about CEPI is they have to select three different targets. So it's not as if it's enabling different vaccine to everything. It's Nipah, uh, uh, Lassa fever, and MERS, coronavirus. It does demonstrate a mechanism by which you can move forward with vaccination. 
Finally, the issue in terms of experimental is how to test the vaccine. That's a big issue, right? Control trial versus no control. How big is the population that you need? That's why this ring vaccination is a very creative way to say, we know after 15 days it's not going to, it's too late. So how about the vaccine early and late and only the high risk and seeing whether there's an effect? And that's how this was, uh, the VSV was developed. Okay, one more quick question on vaccines before I move on to Bonnie and Matt. Um, you know, we, we, ha we now have so many global initiatives on vaccines. You've got the, the Sabin Vaccine Institute. You've got CEPI uh, that um, Victor talked about. You've got the Gavi Alliance. Um, and um, you've got polio eradication at the WHO, which is their largest specialized program. And yet, we've got this miracle prevention, and we're having all these problems with all these institutions. What, is there something that we can do more? Is there something gone wrong? Well, um, yeah, I think that it's, that's a big question. I'm not sure there's a single answer to it. I think that there are individual things that, that could use fixing. Um, I think that the, the polio eradication story is an important one because it's all about the last mile. And so when you look at the, I mean, I, I, I presented one slide of sort of a global picture of all the progress. When, when we were kids, um, what were, we, these were just infections we had. Now they're called vaccine preventable diseases. So in a you know, relatively short period of time, we've, we've, we've moved substantially. But to get to eradication targets, you've got to get the last one. And the last mile is, is tough to reach. So I think focusing on there and focusing on, as the polio group is doing, on the management aspects of getting to the last mile and looking at how that works. Tony talked about operations research to take academic style understandings and see what applies in the field is really critical to trying to think of how we're going to actually achieve those kind of targets. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you know, you, I mean, this audience, everybody knows about the anti-vaxxers, and that's one of the real difficulties in trying to now particularly in people who have mistrust of government, mistrust of everybody else, and more individualism, that in fact we're having a major problem. I mean, at Academy, we think about this all the time. We wrote some of the most important reports about safety of vaccine. So more recently, we went through a major campaign, I hope it's making a difference, of social media, a variety of mechanisms, all coordinated, synchronized. And we even worked with Google to create a misinformation, uh, uh, counter misinformation on vaccine. It's a hard issue, you know. I think it's interesting if I can engage Bruce in talking about public health, whether you can actually at some point step in and mandate it because it's of great concern, right? That's in fact how the polio did happen. Well, that's, I mean, that's in the, in the United States, it was the, it was the school laws that made a huge difference when in, in Los Angeles, they couldn't keep the schools open because they kept having recurrent outbreaks of measles and, the, and the, the, school, the school superintendent and the health commissioners got together and said, well, unless we have an immune population, we just can't run schools. So that was the beginning of that. that right, and now that's happening in LA now with the uh, college campuses. So I actually can cleverly transition from that to <laughs> Bonnie and Matt. Um, because you all talked about mistrust. Um, and if you think about polio, uh, say, in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, with polio workers under attack, well, we're seeing that now in the DRC um, with Ebola. And I know both Bonnie and Matt have worked on this. Um, so can we use the same old public health playbook when we've got wow. political violence, instability, lack of uh, diplomacy, uh, and uh, community mistrust. And if we can't use only that old playbook, what's the future for dealing with complex humanitarian crises? Um, you, you hit the, 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 the problem or the nail. I mean, what we're facing now is, and we've had this discussion about how it's very different from anything we've seen before and the way in which the U.S. has had to respond in terms of you know, not being able to really go to the problem as much as we have in the past because of concerns of safety and security. Um, and this has created a, a, a challenge for how the U.S. and the global community will try to address some of these infectious disease issues when you're in a, when you're in a very instable, in, in unstable environment. 
So the first answer is yes, we do have to think about this differently um, because if you have new challenges, you have to find new solutions. So, and you still have the same threat. Uh, it may be, you know, it could be a different country, um, but the fact that, um, you know, we're, we have to look at how we address a global threat in an un unstable situation um, is true, something we need to think about, just not just for global health, but for other kind of situations as well. So I would think that what we need to do is um, start looking at this fresh and from a different perspective and trying to think about um, what are the different actors we need to bring in? Are there different organizations we need to bring in? Are there different ways of looking at it? Now, the problem is that these are so complex. You know, when you're thinking about, I mean, they, we're going into a complex situation that was complex before the disease started. And we obviously didn't figure out how to fix that situation before we had the disease. So now we have the disease on top of the fact that we had a, a complex situation that we as a global community could not figure out how to address, or we didn't have enough resources dedicated to it um, at the time because maybe it wasn't high enough on the agenda in terms of what do we deal with a particular country. So um, we have all these factors that are making it even more complex now because now we have a disease. Uh, so we do have to step back, not, you know, we still have to keep working on the issue, but we do have to think about um, who are the different actors we need to bring in in terms of dealing with an infectious disease issue that we didn't have at the table before because it was a different type of situation we were dealing with. And, I mean, the, just briefly, I mean, I think the key that I would say is that there is, it's very clear that we are leaving assets unused right now. So it is, um, it is not a mystery that there is a long-ranging, um, decades-long civil war in, in Congo. Um, it's also true that diplomatic intervention and strategic intelligence-based and financial support interventions have in the past been able to achieve short-term short -term peace, right? And so, but none of that is actually seemingly at the disposal of the World Health Organization. So in theory, the IHRs are supposed to kind of bring everybody together, but what's very clear is that A, the, the lack of declaration of a public health emergency um, today slightly boggles my mind. I mean, we are in a situation where literally the committee put out a report saying, well, we, what we really need is more political attention and more financing. My understanding of what, uh, what a public health emergency is supposed to achieve is more political attention and increased financing. So that seems like a, like a mistake in the international sphere. But then also what we know is that the great powers, the kind of major, to Bonnie's point about diplomacy, the great powers are not deploying the assets that they have to try to address this problem. So the question is, what could make them do so? What could incentivize them to do so? Um, and is it really just one case crossing into Rwanda? Or might there be something else that could do that? May I bring up two points here? Yes, just quickly. One, I think it's very clear from all these outbreaks, community engagement is critical. Yes. So diplomacy is not going to be enough. You've got to really understand communities, anthropologists, many others. So that's how we overcame the West Africa Ebola and burial and stuff. And that, in fact, is what's going on also in Congo. That's point number one. Point number two, I mentioned the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which is chaired by Bro uh, Grandlin. Mm. Bro Grand yeah, so I'm on this. Tony Fauci is on it. And that is going to be a major mechanism to push pressure on calling fake, et cetera, because we're independent. We just met in Geneva recently and looked at all these issues. So I think there will be other mechanisms to enable some of these things to move forward. Well, outbreaks and infectious diseases continue to rage, instability, political violence. Um, we haven't quite solved it all here, but uh, we've had a, an amazing panel to help us guide through all of the, the obstacles. So thank you very much. Thank you.